All right, good to see everybody here this evening. Thanks for being here on Christmas Eve. Ms. Slabo, you just going to leave them on their own? Are you going to direct them, or what are you going to do here? All right. Thank you. I think they may need your help, okay? All right, away in a manger. Take your Bible this evening, if you would, please. And I want you to go to the book of Micah, chapter 5. Micah, chapter 5. Micah follows the book of Jonah, if that helps you. If you get to Nahum, you went too far. Habakkuk, just back up a little bit, and you'll find Micah. Micah chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 1 through 4. I'd like to begin on verse 1, and then you join me on 2, and I'll read 3, and we'll end together on verse number 4. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the Scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's Word. And I'll begin on verse 1. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. And he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall abide, for now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this evening and uh, this wonderful prophecy of Micah. Uh, prophesying the birth of the Savior to be in Bethlehem. And Lord, I'm asking that you would help us this evening, and I know that it's so easy for our minds to think ahead of what we may have to do after the service tonight with uh, get-togethers or family or friends, and uh, Lord, maybe thoughts of tomorrow, but I, I pray you'd help us to focus and give you our undivided attention for these next few moments and, and grab, grasp a hold of the truth that is contained here in the scriptures. And I pray that we would find encouragement, we would find uh, help and strength uh, from the truth that we'll glean tonight from the scriptures. So Lord, speak to us. Give us all ears to hear what you would want to say to each of us this evening. It's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. All right, you may be seated. You know, a lot of people have different ideas on what the meaning of Christmas really is. For many people in our culture, it's basically a time of year when they get off work or get out of school or follow different family traditions that people have this time of year. You hear different phrases about what Christmas is all about. Uh, people say giving. That's what Christmas is all about. Chance to give to others. Or helping the unfortunate. 
That's what Christmas is all about. Or being with family. Family, that's what Christmas is all about. Nothing wrong with any of those things, but is that really what Christmas is all about? To our culture, many people, that's what they focus on. Uh, but that isn't what Christmas is all about. What Micah gives us here in Micah chapter 5, when he foretells Bethlehem, Ephrata, has the place that would be the birthplace of one that is going to be the ruler in Israel. And notice, it's not just a ruler in Israel, verse 2, but whose goings forth have been of old from everlasting. That's a reference to the birth of Jesus Christ. The birth of the Savior. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. And notice in verse 4 and 5, he says, He shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord. He's, he's teaching us here that the Lord came into the world for a purpose. The world, Lord came into the world to accomplish something while He was here. When it, That reference about feeding in the strength of the Lord, stand and feed, is a reference to Christ being the shepherd. We know from Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Jesus said in John 10, I am the good shepherd. And, and, and He's going to uh, take care of us as His sheep. And of course, the shepherd leads his sheep and protects his sheep and saves his sheep. And He came to be our shepherd. He looked at the people one day in Matthew 9. He said, in fact, look at Matthew 9, would you? Uh, we'll come back to Micah here in just a moment. But look over at Matthew chapter 9. And we'll look at Jesus' words that He spoke Himself. Matthew 9 and verse number 36. Where the Bible says, When He saw the multitudes, He was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad, as sheep having no, what church? Shepherd. He said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm burdened and I have compassion on these people because they're scattered about and they're like sheep that don't have a shepherd. And he came to be the shepherd. Look at verse number or Matthew chapter 26, a little bit later in the book of Matthew, would you please? Matthew chapter 26. This is at the what's commonly referred to as the Last Supper with, that Jesus had with his disciples before he would go to the cross. Verse 30 talks about how they sung a hymn, and then he went out to the Mount of Olives, and then Jesus said unto them. All ye, verse 31 of Matthew 26, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. So he's saying again, this is a fulfillment of prophecy that not, not just that all the disciples would forsake him and flee, but the fact that he's the shepherd and they're the sheep. And so he's our shepherd. And so I just want to focus tonight for a few minutes and and, and hope I have your attention, that, that what, what Christ gives us as our shepherd. He came, He's the Savior, absolutely. He's the babe in the manger, absolutely. He's the King, absolutely. He's the Lord of Lords, absolutely. But He's our shepherd. And as our shepherd, He gives us, first of all, strength. In Micah 5 and verse 4, again, that phrase we read earlier, He will stand and feed in the strength. Notice the strength of the Lord. When you think about Christ as our shepherd, it's reminding us that we don't live the Christian life in our own strength. It is not difficult to live the Christian life. It is impossible to live the Christian life in your own strength. God made it that way, so we must rely on Him. That's why He gave us the Holy Spirit of God. So we would have a comforter. We would have His power working in us and through us to live the Christian life. God doesn't help those who help themselves. God helps those who are helpless to help themselves. Okay? Uh, that, well, God helps those who help themselves. It's in the Bible. It is not in the Bible. Okay? Make sure you understand that. Uh, but God is looking for those who will rely upon Him for their strength. Well, God will never put any more on you than you can handle. Oh, He will put more on you and handle. Why? So you'll look to Him to help you. He says, I want to strengthen you. And He's there to strengthen us as our shepherd. And He gives us strength. In 1969, while attempting to rescue a fellow soldier, Bob Weiland lost both his legs in Vietnam. In June of 1969, his squad walked into a minefield. 
when a member of his unit stepped on a booby trap mortar, Wyland rushed to give first aid, but he too stepped on an 82 millimeter buried mortar, a round designed to destroy tanks. It severely damaged his legs and they had to be amputated above the knee. In a letter to his parents after the accident, he wrote on June 14, 1969, Dear Mom and Dad, I'm in the hospital. Everything is going to be okay. The people here are taking good care of me. Love, Bob. P.S. I think I lost my legs. That was his letter home. Whedon likes to say of that day, my legs went one direction, but my life went another. He had dreamed of becoming a professional baseball player after the war, but that dream was gone forever. Many men in that situation would have become bitter, but Bob didn't get bitter. He said, I lost my legs, but not my heart. He became a great athlete. He, he has completed a three-year walk across America. He has participated in the race across America on a custom-made bicycle. And he also participated in the Hawaiian Ironman Triathlon. He can bench press 507 pounds. Almost where Brother Yoder is. But getting close. <laughs> but he has learned to cast all his care upon him. That's what he, he said. I have learned to cast all my care on Jesus. I have learned how the weakness of, of uh, God is stronger than man. 1 Corinthians 1.25 in other words, he says, I do the best I can each day to apply the Word of God to my life because I know it works. And that's the kind of strength that Jesus Christ offers to you and me. Don't try to do it on your own. Don't try to handle it by yourself. Your life doesn't have to be characterized by failure and bitterness and, and, and uh, uh, missed opportunities and regret. Life doesn't have to be characterized by that. He'll give you the strength to face whatever comes your way. His name will be called Emmanuel, which is God with us. Think about that. God with us. He is with us in our afflictions. He's with us in our loneliness. He's with us in our disappointments. He's with us in our failures. He's with us in our victories. He's with us in our moments, our, our worst moments, but He's with us, in our, with us in our best moments. He's with us when we're filled with joy, but He's with us when we're filled with sorrow. He's with us in the maternity ward, but He's with us in the cemetery. He's with us when we're hired, but He's with us when we're fired. He's with us when we're full, but He's with us when we're empty. And He's with us when we're walking in the light, but He's also with us when we're wandering in the darkness. God with us. He's a with us God. He's there to help us and strengthen us no matter where we are, no matter what we're experiencing, He's with us. Thank God Jesus came to be God with us. He's always with us. You have a shepherd. You can live in His strength. You don't have to live in your strength. Not just what you can do, but what He can do. I know there's people tonight, you're facing some challenges in your life. Bigger than you are. Bigger than you can handle. You don't have the strength. So many times you hear people say, I don't have the strength to go on. Good. Good. Go to Him for strength. You have to look to Him every day to strengthen you and help you. He's our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. So I get from the shepherd, first of all, strength. The second thing I receive from the shepherd is security. Security. We live in a very insecure world. Neither safety or certainty of safety exists. We spend our lives trying to find both. We look to the government, our employer, our investments, our relationships, but none of those are going to provide you with security you're looking for. That security will only come from Jesus Christ. Like the Vietnam veteran Bob Whelan learned, our world can change in one moment's time. One simple word can change your life forever.
cancer. Divorce. Downsizing. You hear words like that and all of a sudden your world isn't so safe anymore. We don't know what will happen tomorrow. You, don't, you have plans tomorrow for Christmas, but you don't know that that's how it's going to take place. We don't know what can take place in just a few short hours. We can't depend on this world to give us security because it doesn't have it to give. In Micah, in verse number 4, it says, He shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord in the, in, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God and they shall abide. For now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. They shall abide. That word abide means they'll dwell safely. Abide is where you live. You know where you ought to feel safe? You ought to feel safe at home. You ought to feel safe in your own home. And that's a place of safety. And Jesus offers us security to be at home in Him. He said, abide in Me and let My words abide in you. There's security there. There's safety there. And and it lets us know He's in control. He has the power. He has the ability to take care of us. That's what a shepherd does. What did David say in Psalm 23? He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. It's the shepherd taking care of the sheep and making sure they're secure. He's saying, I'll take care of you. You're safe with me. That's what Jesus offers to us. Security. The Bible says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things you have. For He hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I'm told that in the language the Bible was written in, that's a a five negatives in that verse. Now, in, in the English language, when you put two negatives back to back, what does that make it? It makes it a positive. You know, if I say, I know never going to do that, well then I'm going to do that, okay? Uh, it's, it's too negative. But in the, in the Greek language, if there's a negative and there's five of them in a row, it's an emphasis. And literally, what that verse would read, if we read it literally as it was written, it would say, I will no, no, never, never, never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's a pretty good promise. And you think you can lose your salvation? You think there's something you can do that will make that promise of none effect? Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man be able to pluck them out of my hand. I'm in the hand of God. I'm in the hand of Christ, and His hand is in the hand of God. Nothing's going to get to me, but that they allow it to come to me. He's in control. I'm secure in Jesus Christ. What security? It's a great thing. Security not based on circumstances, not based on things, but based on His everlasting love for you and me. He loves me. He loves you too. And and, and He loves us with an everlasting love. He gives me strength. He gives me security. And then thirdly, He gives me serenity or peace. Use serenity because it's an S, you know. Man is constantly looking for peace. Men try to find peace of mind by alcohol or some other substance. Maybe overeating or working or going from relationship to relationship. Or or sometimes just trying to to manufacture the, the perfect life. Or sometimes it's the perfect holiday or the perfect Christmas. A lot of people get all upset because they you have in your mind's eye how everything's going to work tonight or tomorrow. And how everything's going to go and then it doesn't go that way. And then you're all upset. Because it didn't go as you planned it to go. But you have to understand that's, that, that's prepare but don't plan. Prepare but don't plan. Just, just rely, rely upon God to take care of the situation and the circumstances. We are in His hand. Jesus brings peace to those who follow Him. Remember the angel said, uh, on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Not, Not just peace on earth, but on earth was peace. Whose peace? Jesus Christ. 
He's peace. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Everlasting Father, the, the uh, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He's the Prince of Peace. And so He is peace. And the peace was on earth when Jesus came to dwell among us. Verse 5 of Micah says, This man shall be the peace. He shall be the peace. There's no peace. Everybody's all upset about President Trump, you know, declaring Jerusalem the capital and the United Nations voted 128 to 9 against it and everybody's all up in arms and how this is going to negotiate the peace process. There's not going to be peace until the Prince of Peace comes. And He'll make peace because peace will be on the earth. And so, as Jesus was approaching death, He says to His disciples, Peace I leave with you. John 14, 27. My peace I give you. Don't let your hearts be troubled and neither be afraid. So Jesus came to give us peace. And even when there's no peace in the world around us, there can be peace in the world within us. There can be peace in our inner world. Even when there's no peace in the outside world. That's the difference for the believer. Because as we said this morning, the joy and the peace comes from within, not from without. So Jesus came to carry the burdens. He came to lift our anxieties. He came to, of course, forgive our sins. The things that, things that tend to make our life miserable are exact things Jesus came to take. But we don't give them to Him. We still, t- we'll, we'll still worry and have an- anxious moments. And, and we call them concerns. you know. And I'm concerned about this. And that's just a nice way to say I'm worried about it. But we're not... It isn't. It, 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 he has promised that all things will work together for good. So we don't need to get upset about all those things. We have to trust Him that He'll work them out for our good. We just have to love God and be called according to His purpose. Jesus, born in a manger. But that day is just the beginning of His life on earth. That child grew up, became a man who died on the cross for our sins, made the atonement for our sins on Calvary. He given us, he's given us the gift, the gifts of strength, security, and peace. In all the circumstances of your life, you have those three things all the time. If you have Jesus. You have strength, you have security, and you have peace. Trust Him for that. Believe Him for that. God became a man so we could have these things from Jesus Christ. He, we have not a high priest. We don't have a shepherd that is not touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows what we've been through. He knows what you're going through. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So he understands strength, security, serenity, or peace. That's what's offered this Christmas to us. I want to celebrate His birth. I want to be glad that He came. But I don't want to miss the purpose for why He came. I don't want to miss what He offers to us. Don't, if nothing else, take some time by yourself to be alone with God and to thank Jesus Christ for the strength that He gives you. You can look back in your life. as I've looked back in my life. I've been saved over 50 years. And I can look back at some things that we've been through and think, you know, I don't know how we got through that. And if you've been saved for any length of time, you should be able to do the same thing. You know how you got through it? Because God strengthened you. That's how you got through it. The Lord strengthened you. I know we make a big deal about the uh, um, footprints in the sand poem, you know, where, oh, that's where I carried you. Uh, The truth is, He didn't just carry me in the hard times. He carries me all the time. Uh, there's always only one footprint, one set of footprints there, unless, unless I decide I'm going to try it on my own. And that's when we go astray. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Don't go astray by going your own way. Don't go astray by trying to do it in your own strength. It will never work. The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. And so trust him. For your strength, trust Him for your security. Aren't you glad you're secure? Yeah, let me, uh, listen. 
He loves us with an everlasting love. What's everlasting mean? Yeah, never ends. Well, well, but what if I disappoint him? He loves you with an everlasting love. What if I fail him? He loves you with an everlasting love. What if I really mess up? He loves you with an everlasting love. It'll never stop. He'll continue to love you no matter what. That's the love of God. That's the love of Jesus Christ. He's going to love you with an everlasting love. And then he gives us that peace that only God can give when all the rest of the world can be having turmoil and strife. There's a calmness and a peace that comes to our soul. I thank God he's my Savior. But I also thank Jesus that he's my shepherd. He gives me strength, security, and peace. Let's pray together. Shall we, Father, take the truth here this evening. And I pray, Lord, that each of us would enjoy and we would realize and grasp what you have for us and what you have given to us by being our shepherd. Thank you for guiding us and leading us and providing for us. But Lord, particularly tonight, for the strength you give us. I know there's folks in this room that are looking at some difficult battles. Relationships marriage struggles, physical struggles, struggles with children, struggles at work, struggles financially. And Lord, they're weary. They're looking at it and say, I don't know if I can do this. And Lord, strengthen them. May they look to you. May they say, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. May we realize we're secure in you. Lord, you're going to love us and you'll always love us. and You'll always be there for us. You will never leave us nor forsake us. There's no need to be insecure as a believer. Thank you for the peace that passes all understanding. Thank you for the peace that you give to us. It's not, a, not about our circumstances. You're the Prince of Peace. And when we allow you to rule in our heart, then the peace of God rules in our heart. We love you, Lord. Thank you so much for becoming a man and being our shepherd. I pray that you'll minister to people this evening. You'll be with each of us as we have our different get-togethers and celebrations. And I pray, Lord, we'd, you'd keep this, these thoughts in our mind and our heart. And we'd take time to pause sometime tonight or tomorrow and just say, Jesus, thank you for your strength, for your security, for your serenity, for your peace that passes all understanding. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to finish praying here in just a moment. I'm not going to give an invitation per se this evening. But I wonder, I wonder if you're here tonight and you say, Preacher, you know, on this Christmas Eve, I needed to hear that. I needed to hear about Christ being my shepherd and the strength and the security and the serenity that he brings. And I will take time in the next day or so to just quietly sit with my Lord and thank him for those gifts to me. Pastor, pray for me this evening. The Lord dealt with my heart tonight. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Amen. Amen. That's wonderful. You may put them down. Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. Thank you for people who are sensitive to the Holy Spirit. As you minister to and speak to people's hearts through the Word of God. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just conform to the world in our celebration of Christmas. But that we truly would focus on Jesus Christ and not only... Him coming to earth and Him being our Savior, but what He means to us as our Savior and our Shepherd. So Lord, we love You this evening. Pray Your blessing on each family, each individual that's here. And please give them safety. Lord, some will be traveling tonight or tomorrow, and I pray You'd watch over them. And please give them journey mercies on their travels. Lord, bless the times with family and loved ones and those whom we need to witness to in our families over these next few days. Uh, give us opportunity and boldness to take the opportunity to tell them 
about the Savior. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In 1847, you want to come on up? In 1847, a poet in France was commissioned to write a poem for the Christmas Mass. He did so, and it was immediately widely accepted throughout France and soon Europe. An American writer, John Sullivan Dwight, felt that this wonderful Christmas song needed to be introduced to America. He saw something in the song that moved him beyond the story of the birth of Christ, for John Sullivan Dwight was an ardent abolitionist, and he strongly identified with the lines of the third verse of this song, which says, Truly He taught us to love one another. His law is love, and His gospel is peace. Change shall He break. For the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. The text supported Dwight's own view of slavery in the South. He published in his magazine his translation of O Holy Night, and it quickly found favor in America, especially in the North during the Civil War. Both the French Arthur and Dwight were old men when on Christmas Eve 1906, Reginald Fessenden, a 33-year-old university professor and former chemist for Thomas Edison, did something long thought impossible. Using a new type of generator, Fessenden spoke into a microphone, and for the first time in history, a man's voice was broadcast over the airwaves. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. He began in a clear, strong voice, hoping he was reaching across distances he supposed he would. Shocked radio operators on ships and astonished wireless owners at newspapers sat slack-jawed as their normal coded impulses heard over tiny speakers, were interrupted by a professor reading from the Gospel of Luke. To the few who caught the broadcast, it must have seemed like a miracle. Hearing a voice somehow transmitted to those far away, some might have believed they were hearing the voice of an angel. Fessenden was probably unaware of the sensation he was causing on ships and in offices. He couldn't have known that men and women were rushing to their wireless units to catch the Christmas Eve miracle. After finishing his recitation of the birth of Christ, Fessenden picked up his violin and he played O Holy Night, the first live song ever sent through the air via radio waves. When the carol ended, so did the broadcast but not before music had found a medium that would take it around the world. Since that first rendition at a Christmas service in 1847, O Holy Night has been sung millions of times in churches in every corner of the world. And since the moment a handful of people first heard it played over the radio, the carol has gone on to become one of the most recorded and played spiritual songs. And Bob's going to sing for us tonight to conclude our service, O Holy Night. O Holy Night, the stars are brightly shining, it is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, oh, hear the angel voices, oh, night divine. Cry. 
Christ was born. O night, O holy night, O night divine, truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love, and his gospel Amen. is peace. Chains shall he break, for the slave is a brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy, in grateful chorus raise we. Let all within us praise his holy name. Christ is the Lord. Oh, praise his name forever. His stand together, shall we? Father, we thank you now for this evening. Thank you again for the wonderful night when our Savior was born. Thank you for the sinless life that he lived, for his willingness to lay down his life for us. The only one who ever chose death, that he, we might live and we might have eternal life forever with him. Thank you. He rose again from the dead conquered death for us and he ascended to heaven where he makes intercession for us at the right hand of God. Lord, we love you. Thank you for all you've given to us and all you've done for us way far and beyond what any of us would deserve. And we're thankful for your grace. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. Watch over each individual and family, please, and bless the celebrations, bless the get-togethers that we'll experience over the next few days. Lord, I pray that First and foremost, we'll keep you at the center of our Christmas celebrations. Watch over us, and if you tear, you're coming. Bring us back for our service on Wednesday evening. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Dr. John R. Rice, anybody remember that name? A couple of you might remember it. He, uh, he said the Christmas angel came. And he looked down at the shepherds, and he said, he had his glasses, he always had his glasses off, he said, and the Christmas angel said, Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> I don't know if that's what he said or not, but uh, he said, that's what we'll say. Merry Christmas to you. Have a great night, all right? God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>